All right, welcome back. We are in our second lesson over fingerprints. So in a previous lesson, we just talked about fingerprints in general and the different classifications of fingerprints and patterns. Um, we also talked about the commonality of different types of fingerprints and the patterns that exist within the world population. Uh, and then today we're specifically going to talk about different patterns that fingerprint analysts look for when they are trying to match a crime scene print to a suspect print. So just a quick review, fingerprinting as a means of personal identification has been around for quite some time. Uh, we also learned in a previous lesson that fingerprints are a reproduction of the friction skin ridges that are found on our fingertips. We know that fingerprints can be classified in three ways, loops, whirls, and arches, and then you can further classify from there. 65% of the population has loops, making loops the most common fingerprint pattern. 30% whirls and 5% of the population has arches. So arches is the least common, most unique pattern on a fingerprint. When a fingerprint touches a surface, uh, perspiration and oils are transferred to that sur surface leaving behind a print. Uh, we can have latent prints or patent prints, and we're going to talk about those in a future lesson. So for today's lesson, you need to know that fingerprints remained unchanged throughout an individual's lifetime. So fingerprints are actually formed in the womb, and they stick with a person throughout their lifetime. Now there are some exceptions. For example, injuries. So if you um, have ever been cut on your fingertip and you have a scar, then that would be an example of a way that your fingerprint would change throughout your lifetime. But for the most part, fingerprints remain unchanged. The individuality of a fingerprint is not determined by its general classification, which means that a fingerprint analyst is not going to look at a suspect print compared to a uh, crime scene print and say, oh, these are both loops, so they must be a match. However, uh, they do look at what's called minutia patterns. So these are more specific patterns within the fingerprint that fingerprint analysts look for, and they try to get as many minutia patterns in common before they call a match a match. So fingerprint analyst compares those common ridge patterns and minutia patterns. We're going to look at some of those patterns today. If you'll look at the picture on the left, this is not all inclusive of all the patterns, but these are some of the most common patterns uh, and then the names for those patterns. And we are going to do a little bit of practice where we try to identify these different minutia patterns in a fingerprint. So, um, in, but if we do that, I will always give you um, like a little cheat sheet like you see on the screen. So you can see in the picture on the right of the screen some different minutia patterns, what they look like in a real life fingerprint. So for years, experts have debated on how many ridge comparisons are necessary in, to, in, to identify two fingerprints as a match or the same fingerprint or coming from the same person. And different jurisdictions require different numbers of minutia patterns in common before a match is declared. Usually it's 8 to 16 points of comparison in common. And then they're able to say, oh, well, this is... 85% likely that it's a match, or this is 90% likely that it's a match. Uh, some experts believe that fingerprints are not an exact science and actually should not be the only uh, means of a conviction. So there are a lot of people out there that believe that fingerprints are not unique, and there are some cases that exist in history um, that really call this practice and this theory that no two people have the same print into question. And we're going to look at that today. I'm going to um, let you do some of your own research on that. So I'm curious to know what you think. What do you believe? Do you think that fingerprints are acceptable forms of evidence that can be used to convict someone of a crime? Or do you think maybe some other evidence has to go along with it? All right, so what I want you to do is I want you to um, take a look at Frontline PBS's The Real CSI. So it was a program put out by Frontline, which is um, a, a 
a show that's on PBS and you can do a quick Google search. Just search Frontline PBS's The Real CSI and you should be able to find that video. I want you to watch the first like 20, 20 minutes of the video because that's where they talk about uh, the Brandon Mayfield case. So I want you to check out that case. It is really interesting. It really calls to question some of the practices that we use in forensics. Um, now personally, I still do believe Believe that fingerprints has its place in forensics and um, definitely can be the only means to convict someone, but it does, you know, bring up some questions. Uh, and I'm just curious to know if it's going to do the same for you. So I will put the link in the description box. I also have the URL link here if you just want to copy it down. I want you to watch this video and then be ready to discuss what you find.